Okay. Uh, take your Bibles and turn back with me to Psalm 68. I told you last week we didn't get finished with that, and I wasn't going to rush through it. And uh, so we're going to try to finish that up tonight and, um, and, and, and that kind of thing, okay? Um, I read a lot of that psalm. I don't think I read all of that psalm, and, uh, but I, I, I read some of it. And uh, I, want to, I want to go back up and, and, and look at and sort of give you the, the, the outline of this psalm tonight if I could. could. Last week, what we talked about, and I got, I got, I sort of got stuck on, was the verse uh, four there. If you'll remember, we, we talked about the name of God, and, and the name and, and the significance of that. And uh, again, it's kind of interesting, um, uh, you know, how that works out and it, the transliteration that uh, that works out in the scriptures there. And we, and I could have gone a lot more other places, um, uh, you know that places that are that are used th that name and um and, and it's kind of and, and it's an interesting name and uh, if you think about it we we put the j in it from the english gets the the, the english uh version and now you put the j in it but originally it was the y and, and and it goes back to this shortened form of yahweh and uh we call it jehovah and uh it, it there's they're one in the same okay and uh, some people if you go back and find a hebrew there's a group out there called Hebrew Christians, I, I, and I really don't really halfway understand them. Really, they don't stick with the Jewish rites because they don't agree with them. But yet, uh, they they say they're Hebrew Christians, and they're not Jewish. <laughs> That's what I can't figure out. And uh, so uh, the way I look at it, and like I told this one guy recently, you know, when a person gets saved, there is no Jew or Greek. We're all one in Christ. And, uh, and so, you know, when you're part of the church, there's not, there's not a, a, a difference between a, a Jew or a Gentile. We're all one. And uh, now there, I think in the end times, when it comes down to the millennial kingdom and, the, and, and, and all that kind of stuff, I think there's going to be some differences. I think that, you know, how God uh, applies the promises of old to Israel versus how he applies the promises to the church. I think that's going that's going to be that's going to be different. That's the reason we're not covenant theologians. We don't, you know, you know, when you look at uh, theology, there's several ways to look at theology, and uh, and remember, theology is man man made what man's thinking thoughts about God are. Okay, you have reformed theology, covenant theology, systematic theology. You 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 got those, and man has changed. Therefore, the word reformed. I mean, why why are you going to reform something? You know, but uh, covenant theologians, they, they you know, they, they, they believe in the covenant. They think the covenants of Israel are going to be applied to the church just like the, and that, I just don't believe that's true. I just, because we don't have, as a Gentile and as the church, the promise of the land. We don't have that. We don't have that promise. We, we you know, we're not part of the Jewish nation. And that is the reason it gets into Reformed theology because of the fact that, <clears throat> They can't differentiate between the election. Remember when we studied Arminianism versus uh, Calvinism? When you get into election, they, they, you know, the Reformed theologians, they say, well, we're elected. You know, God elects. Well, you know, you know I, I look at it like this. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then when you go there, then you're the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So election has to do, uh, doesn't have to do with salvation. And then in Romans Eight, what seven, eight, nine? When 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 Paul is talking in there, that is talking about a national election, talking about the Jews particularly as a nation, and he talks about it in those chapters. So if 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 your thought process about theology is a lot like dispensationalism, and I don't want to really confuse anybody, I'm just trying to say there's a reason why the belief is the way that it is. Okay, there's a reason why. And, and, and if, if dispensationalism teaches simply this. God deals with his people at different times, different ways. And it's obvious if you go back and read the Bible, he's not dealing with you and I like he dealt with Adam and Eve. He's not dealing with us like he did in the days of the kings. He's not dealing with us as like he did in the day of the judges. He's not dealing with us as he did in the days of the prophets. 
He's not dealing with us today in, in, in the early days prior to the cross and, uh, and, and shortly after the cross because if he did, if he did, wouldn't be many of us left. <laughs> so there's, there, there's, a, there's a difference between how God deals with his people throughout the centuries. And people have labeled that as dispensationalism. And, uh, and, and, and you have dispensations, um, different ones. Now, I don't care how you want to count them. You, you can look up as many Bible scholars, and some of them will say you got four, some of them will say you have five, some of them say you have seven, some of them say you have nine, some of them say you got as many as 13. I don't care how you want to break them down. It's obvious that God deals differently in the past than He, ha- than he does now in the present. It's, it, it's obvious. So that causes us to say, okay, what's the difference back in the law when God was so... Because a lot of the people today that don't want to believe the Bible said God was a, 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 a terrible God in the Old Testament. He was mean. He killed a lot of people, judged a lot of people. Well, it was the day of the law. And thank God we live in a day of grace. Amen. 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 So we, we know we got two. So that they, the dispensation of law and dispensation of grace. We know we got two. Now, ever how you want to divide the others up, that's up to you. But uh, I'm, I'm not going to get lost with it, okay? I'm just going to say there, there are more than two, I, trust me. But, <laughs> you know, and, but when we get into it, God deals with it. And there's a difference when we look at these Psalms and we look at the prophets, we look at Daniel versus Revelation. It's going to also alter your view of eschatology. And what that means, study the end times. When we study the end times, who will go through the tribulational period? Who won't go through the tribulational period? It, that's the reason you got a whole you got a whole thing out there argument out there. You got the pre-tribs who believe that Jesus is coming before the tribulation. That happens to be you if you don't know that. And uh, you got mid-trib who believe that that's going to come. No, he's coming halfway between the beginning and the end. Then you got post-trib means he's going to come after. There's still some of them left, by the way, and uh, amazingly, but there are. And uh, and and then. And you say, how, well, how does, why is that such a big deal? If you don't have your view of Israel right, you will not have your view of the Bible right. You've got to have your view of that nation right. And people today all, and, and they still, if you want to get a, uh, at work, at school, at wherever, if you want to get a big, a big discussion started, start talking about uh, end times. They'll talk to you about it. People intrigued with it. And every time something happened, boy, the, Jesus is coming, ain't he? It's getting close, ain't he? Hey, I said, look, well, you're looking at the wrong thing. They're looking at Russia and the Ukraine. They're looking at the United States and everything going on here. Look, watch Israel. Watch Israel. Just keep your eye on that little nation over there and just watch them. Because God's whole prophetic calendar is wrapped around that one nation. And uh, because everything after the rapture is particularly pointed to them, not anything else. The world is going to get wrapped up in it, don't get me wrong, but it's for them. That's the that's primary thing. What's the millennial reign, which we're talking about it in these four chapters. We, we've talked about them in, the, in, the, in these four psalms, excuse me. But uh, we've talked about in these four psalms, the millennial kingdom. What is the millennial kingdom? Is the millennial kingdom for us? No, not particularly. It's for the Jews. Because, see, they've been looking for the millennium, the kingdom, for a while. Right? Ever since, ever since John, the, the Baptist, came and hit the ground running, what did he preach? What was the first words out of his mouth? Repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Jesus come along, he was, he was, he was saying the same thing. Repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And he did that, from, if you read Matthew, Matthew chapter 1 through chapter 12, and then when you get to chapter 13, all of a sudden that message of the kingdom stopped. There was no more mention of repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. You know why? There was a change in, in chapter 12. That's what, you remember, go back and, 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 and you know, uh, that was the fact that, that Israel as a nation turned their back on Christ, rejected Him. And then you have the parables in Matthew 13. You have all those parables. Well, 
Jesus had to revert to parables because of hard-headed people didn't understand like us, don't understand. So he had to revert to earthly stories to signify a heavenly meaning. And he talked about the pearl of great price. He talked about all of those single things, the coin, the, you know, the, the, all, all those things. And he's pointing it to the church. That's who he's pointing it to. And then from chapter 13 on, what was he doing? Don't repent for the kingdom of heaven's a hand. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. That's what was going to happen. So a whole change there. But in, in, in Psalm 68, and I say all that to say this, because we have to get our, 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 chrono, our chrono, chronology of biblical events, and that's what I strive to do, and I probably fail at doing that. I'm sorry, but I probably fail at doing that a lot of times. But because it's, it's not a whole lot, but it is if you're not used to it. Let me just put it that way. Okay? Somebody like me that looked at it a whole lot, I follow it. But, it, it, you know, but if somebody don't look like a whole lot, you say, wait a minute. You said this, you said this. There was a lot of things going on simultaneously, going on side by side, going, just going on down through time. Okay? So <clears throat> the church is going to be here. We're going to be in the millennium. And uh, because remember what the Bible tells us when, in 1 Thessalonians, when he comes back for us, he's going to take us away. And then when he comes back, 2 Thessalonians, we're going to be with him. He's not coming for us. He's coming, we're coming back with him. There's, and what are we going to do? Rule and reign with him on this earth. That's what we're going to do. I don't know what we're going to be doing. I just know we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. I know that. Okay? I don't have a detailed description of the job description of what we're going to have. I just know what we're going to be doing. So let's, let's look on here. They had, the first 18 verses, I tried to get into that, and I'm not going to spend much more time on that tonight, but it, it talks about the past of Israel. Uh, regardless of their national faults and their national failings, they had a brilliant past. I mean, you go back and look at how God blessed that nation and still, and, and in many ways still blessing it. And, and you know, and, and in all of their apostasy, God used them as what? as an example to the other nations. That's exactly what he's using them for, and he's still using them for. And um, he talked about the first six verses about the sovereign helper that they had. And I think I mentioned that. Uh, then I got tied up in the word named Jah. And then he talked about this significant history in verse 7. O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness. Where is he talking about? He went back all the way back to when they were marching in the wilderness. So he's way back in history in, in, in this section here. And, and, and he talked about divine presence. He says, we realize you were there. Look at verse 8. The earth shook. The heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God. You know what's all wrapped up in that verse? Remember when Moses came down from the mountain and he couldn't look at him because he'd been in the presence of God and because God told him, look, I want to see your face. And he says, look, I can't show you. You know, if I do, you won't be able to survive. And uh, so uh, that's what's all wrapped up in that verse. But you got to know the story and know the history here to know what the psalmist is talking about. Any Jew reading this would understand it. And so... And he's talking about moved at the presence of God. And, uh, and then when we get into uh, verse 9, still the history, Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. Thy congregation have dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. And then he gets into the spiritual heritage. Man, what a, I mean... He announced his victory in verse 11. The Lord gave the word, and great was the company of those that published it. And look at verse 12. Not only was victory uh, announced, but victory was appropriated. Kings of armies did flee apace, and she that tarried at home divided the spoils. That's talking about Israel's many victories of the past and the wars that they fought. And, and then in verse number 13, Though ye have lain among the pots, ye shall be as of the wings of a dove covered with silver, her feathers with yellow gold. That's victory acclaim. Look at verse 14. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, it was white 
as snow and salmon. Victory acknowledged. They acknowledged that they had victory in God. And uh, then in verse 15, it says, The hill of God is as the hill of Bashan, a, and a high hill as the hill of Bashan. High, talking about the high places of Israel, the holy places of Israel. In verse number uh, 17, uh, verse 16, it says, Why leap ye, ye high hills? This is the, high, the hill which God desired to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also that the Lord God might dwell among men. Now here's an interesting passage in verse 18. Verse 18 is very interesting. Remember back when we were studying prophecy, I told you, it's amazing how God wrote the Bible. Listen, this is a living document. This is not like a man writing a book and you can read it, get all things from it and all this. Man can't write this good. But thousands of years before, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Ephesians, you know, was penned and Paul came on to the scene. This statement here is found in the book in, in the New Testament where he said he led captivity captive, but he wasn't talking about Jews. He's talking about those that were in the holding place that when Jesus died, where did he go? He descended into Sheol. He descended into the grave. Why did he go to the grave? Prior to the death of Christ, people who died could not go into the presence of God. And here's where a lot of confusion takes place. That's where the Catholics believe in purgatory. And so before, people, before the cross, when people died, they went to a place called paradise. And we see that in, in, in the, you know, the, the rich man and, and Lazarus. We see that. We, that's the picture that we're given. Well, what happened to paradise? There is no paradise now. There's heaven and hell. That's what it is now. So what, what, what made the difference? When Jesus died, he descended into hell. If you want to use the word the King James translates into it, it's fine. He says, my soul descendeth into hell. But it talked about Sheol. What Sheol? The place of the departed spirits. That's where all the departed spirits went. The she paradise was a place divided in two. Remember what Abraham told the rich man? When rich man saw Abraham, I mean, uh, Lazarus sitting in Abraham's lap, uh, 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 and, and he says, he says, there's a great gulf fixed betwixt us. You can't come here, and they can't go there. Evidently, there was something there that could be seen, right? Evidently. And so... After Christ died and descended, the Bible says he led captivity captive. In other words, those souls that died prior to the cross but accepted the God's grace, you saved the same way. I was taught for many, many years that people in the Old Testament got saved different than the people in the Old and New Testament. That's not true. You still saved by grace and not by works. It's just now we're in the age of grace and they were under the age, in the age of the law. But they still had to accept God for what he was and believe on God. The Bible says Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Not I offered Isaac, therefore because I offered Isaac, you're going to save me. That's not why. The reason Abraham offered Isaac was because he believed God. That's why he offered Isaac. So it's no matter how you look at it. And, and, and what's, what's the truth? But this, uh, le you know, leading captivity, captivity they have to receive gifts of men for the rebellious also. The Lord took them to heaven. And now when somebody dies in the Lord, according to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives us insight in this. He says to be absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. We go right straight into the presence of God. Our spirit does. Body does. Body stays in the ground until it's raptured out. And um, so... Then when you get into verse 19 to verse um, 30, well, actually to the rest of the, 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 the psalm, we see Israel's blessed prospects. Here's where you get into the millennial side of things. Uh, the exile is ending in verse 19. You know, they went into exile. Blessed be, look at verse 19. <clears throat> blessed be the Lord who daily lo, lo, loadeth 
us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Uh, you know, not just the Babylonian, but the worldwide dispersion of the Jews over across the land. You know, the, you know one of the things that's happening, and I don't know that it's happening at an alarming rate, but I think it picks up and picks up. And there are times when the Jews decide we're going back home. And they, they pick up wherever they are and they get back to Israel. Because Israel's been scattered all over the world. And the reason they were scattered because they were taken into captivity and they were scattered. And that's part of the judgment of God upon them. God kicked them out of the land. That, that's part of it. That's part of the judgment. And that's what Thessalonians was written for, for and especially 2 Thessalonians was written for, is because if you go back and read the first part of 2 Thessalonians, you'll find those that are scattered abroad. And it's talking to the Jews that are scattered and, and, and going through uh, a lot of, uh, you know, humiliation and, and, and you know, from, from, company, from uh, countries around the world and still are, still are. And uh, loaded us with benefits and, 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 you know, and hope, hope and this, this hope that they have is coming to an end, this, this exile. And the exile ended in verse 21. And it says, but God shall wound the head of the en- wound the head of the enemies and hairy scalp of such a one of goeth on steel in his trespasses. The Lord shall said, I will bring again from Bashan. I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. Who is his people? It's talking about the Jews not talking about us it's talking about the Jews and um, these are the closing and from verse 21 to verse 23 he says in verse 23 that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of thy dogs in the same these are the closing days of the tribulational period right here in these verses because you go back and read Revelation you go back and read Daniel and you find out what's going to happen toward the end of the tribulational period in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That's where the blood's going to be up to the horse's bridle. Remember? And the Jews, that's where you're getting this analogy here in, 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 in verse 23 where it says, that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies. You, that's where God's going to defeat the nations in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That's the closing days of the tribulational period. Uh, the nation will be released, the nation's going to be regathered, and the nation is going to be revenged. That's the nation of Israel. Mark it down, folks, that this little old country preacher in Tallahassee, Alabama, told you that the nation of Israel is one day going to be released. It's going to be regathered to the land that they were promised, and they're going to be revenged by every nation that, I, that did them wrong. God's promised it, and God will do it, and that's going to happen. And then nothing, no politician or no country, I don't care what the military might going to do, is going to stop it. There's been a lot of countries. Russia tried to go against Israel. And Russia sent them back packing. I mean, Israel sent them back packing. And, and it don't matter. And it don't matter who comes against them. They got the, the you know, they got the God dome over there. That's what I call it. You know, you know, I call it the, you know, we sent them the iron dome. That's what we have, that missile system that we have to protect the incoming rockets. The iron dome, I think it's called. And, uh, but they got one better, be, bigger and better than that. I promise you, it's God don't. They can't beat them. You know, they can't beat them. And, um, and then in verse 24 through 27, they have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of my God, my King in the sanctuary. The singers went before the players and the instruments follow after. Among them were the damsels playing with temp- timbrels. Bless ye God in the congregations, even the Lord from the fountains of, fountain of Israel. There is a little Benjamin with their ruler, the princes of Judah and their council, the princes of Zebulun and the princes of Naphtali. What is that? Now those, those are tribes of Israel, right? Remember that? Okay. Thy God hath commanded thy strength. Uh, strength. Strengthen, O God, that which thou hast wrought us. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. Read that again. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem. Temple's not there right now. Cody been there. Ain't no temple there, is it? <laughs> it ain't no temple there. But there will be. The Jews will be will re- rebuild the temple. 
Now, I've heard for years, and, I, and I've been in the ministry a long, long time, and I've heard people been over there, and I've heard that, oh, well, you know, they, they've been gathering materials and all that kind of stuff. Brother John, you probably heard that for years, too. They've been gathering materials. Well, they've been gathering materials a long, long time <laughs> to build that thing. Um, I think when they do it, they're going to do it. That, that's just that's the way it's going to happen. And um, I, I've heard several years ago that the, they found the eternal flame. Uh, supposedly of the sacrifice that, that was lit on the, in, in the, on the altar, that, the, that, that flame that God lit, that was kept in the Qumran caverns, that they found some nomads that had, had it. I'm not sure. My understanding is that Israel's been doing DNA testing to locate and narrow down who the descendants of Aaron are so that they can reinstate the Arianic priesthood. Because remember, during the, tribula during the tribulational period, they're going to start back sacrificing at least for the first three and a half years. And then the Antichrist is going to go to the temple, which will already be rebuilt. And I don't know if they'll be able to rebuild that thing in three years. They might. I guess they will. I'm just wondering if the temple is going to be rebuilt before the tribulational period starts. If that's the case, we could see it. I would often wonder how the, how, how the ramifications of that's going to work. But... Anyway, they're going to start back offering sacrifices because in the middle, Antichrist is going to go to the temple. He's going to declare himself God, going to cause, the Bible says, the oblation to cease. What is that? The sacrifices. He's going to stop them all. So in order for G the Jews to reinstate the sacrifices, there's a lot of things that got to take place. Number one, you got temples got to be rebuilt. Number two, the eternal flame's got to be found. Number three, the Arianic priesthood's got to be determined. Those three things have to be. Now, my understanding is they're working on it, but, I, you know, I don't have any in, in with no uh, nomadic, nomadic Jews over there to find out the, the real thing. But we'll see in verses, you know, 30 to, to the end of that psalm there that um, they're going to be rebuking the company of spearmen, verse 30, and then in verse 31, princes shall come out of the Egypt, Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands, with who? Unto God. All of a sudden, everybody's going to praise God. Every, hymns are going to be sung. In verse 32, Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. Oh, sing praises unto the Lord. They're going to be, in the, in, and it's going to be seen by all. Look at the last few verses too. Hint to him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, verse 33, Lo, he does send out his voice, and that a mighty voice. Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O God, thou art terrible out of thy holy places. The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. That's talking about the, the, the days of the, the millennium when uh, there's going to be praises sung out, there's going to be hymns sang, everybody's going to be in there doing it, and it's going to be seen by everybody. And uh, what a day that's going to be. Amen. And, then that, and that's what this psalm is, um, is teaches, that and the three psalms before it. There's a quartet of psalms that talks about the millennial kingdom there of God, uh, of Christ. Okay? And uh, so... Uh, read that, and when you read that, read that with the millennium in mind. That way it, it, you, you'll make, what is he referring to? And you've got to go back and look at the history of it, okay? Let's go to the Lord.